Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Welcome back, everyone, to the Algorithmic Advantage. Here we are on episode number two, where Rich and I are just speaking amongst ourselves still before we go out into the big bad world and interview the other um, great uh, portfolio managers and, and so on that we have lined up. So you're stuck with the two of us for one more show and you get to get to know us and how we trade a little more. So today I'm going to be asking Rich how he trades and um, and what his uh, strategies are all about. So let's launch straight into it, Rich. How are you doing? Welcome, Simon. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, I'm good. Um, well, mate, I think as always, we will uh, start with a, a little brief uh, bio, a little brief background on yourself and um, how you got into the markets and, and ultimately how you got into trading. Sure, Simon. So uh, back in the, the old days of 1985, came out of college, a couple of degrees under my belt, thought I knew everything, um, went into finance, um, got involved in um, the, the financial controlling operations of a listed company. And in that environment, um, the listed company changed its course um, into uh, the financial services industry and um, I therefore picked up a few extra hats in my role in financial controlling um, in areas such as compliance, fund administration, fund management, um, working for uh, what they call a responsible entity which is a trustee here in Australia. Um, it was a great opportunity to get thrown into the deep end um, and learn um, extensively um, uh, about risk, um, um, particularly in relation to risk that the controlling entity had in relation to the investment managers that plugged into its network. And I was also exposed to a lot of the, the, the trading and investment processes adopted by the investment managers. Um, so um, that led me initially in the path of, of fundamental or value investing um, and uh, that evolved over time to where I am now. Um, at the same time, there was a, a strong passion I had with science and I had these two strands of uh, my career path in finance and my, my science um, journey. Um, they were traveling in tandem together and um, the, the, the scientific path forced me to um, challenge a lot of notions that um, were found in economics uh, with scientific principles. And uh, that led me into a, a fairly counterintuitive space now, where I'm now what you call a, a diversified systematic trend follower. Did, um, when you say that interest in science, I know you're very interested in, in, in physics, for example, was that just a personal interest or had you was that part of your studies it was um, th th I, my my courses at university were science based um, mm -hmm. and uh, when i came out um, into the financial world i always wanted to assess things economically in terms of scientifically so mm. um, i got a huge slap in the face from my father um, who i admired and respected amazingly so when I came out of college, I, I thought I knew everything. And I went to my father, pronouncing with confidence that I, I knew a lot. And he, uh, he, in his very elegant way, put me down and told me how I perhaps might not know as much as I think I know. And to go along a path of what, what he called step, um, standing on the, the giants, the shoulders of giants, standing on the shoulders of giants, those who have um, investigated these queries that I was thought that I knew the answers of um, and uh, in that investigation in my science path um, it, it demonstrated how little I knew and um, over the course of time um, the, the, 
the investigation into science enabled me to challenge um, traditional economic theory and look at different models that perhaps were more applicable to more real world situations than what was being announced by the economic community. So uh, the, the, the science path to me was sort of a bit ahead of the economics path. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that gave me a good heads up into looking at these um, opportunities that were perhaps a bit more advanced in the scientific world and the physics world, and um, then applying that back to the economics framework. So, um, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, the, the economics framework up until about the 1980s was um, severely entrenched in this concept of the efficient markets hypothesis. And um, in the 1980s, um, there was uh, a, a slight um, e evolution of new ideas, new models, new theories that were really challenging that concept. And they were typically coming from the scientific background. So um, that's where I got very involved in, in a multidisciplinary approach to um, trying to assess these markets, which I view as complex adaptive systems. And um, from that approach, I think I've gained insights that have really helped me um, establish the niche that I want to occupy in trading and investing in these markets. So how early on did you get involved in, um, in actually starting to test something or test strategies and get into that systematic trading stuff? And you know, when did software become available or were you doing things in Excel? Like how did that, how did that originate? When I started out, uh, I was always deeply involved in systematic processes, empirical validation. But, you know, I, I was trying to adopt the scientific method for economics. So uh, the way I'd do that is I'd have a model of how I think a system behaves, and then I would validate that through an empirical process, typically through a form of backtesting process. Um, so back in the day, um, we didn't have uh, necessarily um, the computer power that we have. So I was using things like the Huntley reports, which uh, were written reports of uh, looking at um, uh, the fundamental value of different companies, price earnings ratios, all of these things, all sort of in text, text in a big book that came out monthly, the, Hunt, the Huntley report. Mm -hmm. And then I was transferring that data into an Excel spreadsheet and then uh, evaluating um, the, my, my intrinsic value of these particular companies. And so that, that's how I, I started out. Um, but then as, as um, technology grew and grew, this became far easier. And therefore, I started looking at systematic ways to really assist my efforts uh, and fast track the, the analysis um, to a point where I'm very comfortable now uh, in the speed that I can assess and validate things using um, fairly rigorous um, analytical computer assisted methods. Great. All right. So that's fascinating. Um... If we were to move along then into, I guess, what frames that trading style that you have now? What's your broader philosophical approach um, to the markets coming out of that science and um, uh, systematic background? So I, I suppose the, the broad frame of my approach is that I view these markets as a very competitive landscape. And uh, in that landscape, I view the participants in that market. So I'm very much um, looking at what we call agent-based models, the, uh, the behavior of an individual participant and the behavior of collectives, how they all interact together and how that moves price. So the way I view these markets in a very competitive landscape is I think that the majority of the participants um, in that market are what I call predictive traders, predictive investors. They're using principles of extracting an edge through pattern recognition, predictive processes that basically say, um, based on my assessment of a backtest and, and uh, a rigorous application of that backtest, my assessment of the patterns in that backtest or the data in that backtest, I, with a, a fairly high degree of confidence, can project that uh, into an uncertain future with a degree of reliability. And um, so I, I looked at that and I saw that about 90% of the market participants were doing that. Um, it was not just industry itself that was doing that uh, with their particular models of, of theory, uh, but it was also, um, you know, when you go to the YouTube blogs and you look at, um, you know, these gurus on YouTube, how they tell you how easy it is, etc. They're all uh, umbrellaed within this predictive um, 
mindset effectively, mm -hmm. which I think is about 90% of the market. Now, I recognize that um, there is a degree of predictability in the market and there is an edge to be extracted from that, but it's an incredibly competitive landscape, 90%. Um, so uh, the edge is continually eaten away as uh, more sort of, uh, you know, the Renaissance technologies of medallions, etc. you know, they get most of that edge. Um, mm. the, the stragglers with less resources at their disposal get less of an edge. Some of them are lucky and get a bit of an edge or whatever. So that 90% is, is that area. So I said to myself, let's don't go down that path because in my scientific background i knew that these there were these features of complex adaptive systems which were inherently uncertain so um, this meant that uh, if you look at your your different systems uh, that you can deploy in the market there are sort of four broad categories there's the simple system which is the what i call the known knowns um, the pendulum um, a predictable pattern oscillating to and forth. That's a simple system. You get a complicated system, which is what I call the known unknowns. This is where uh, you know the underlying theory, you're just presented with a novel um, um, system, and that underlying theory is sufficient to explain that theory, the known unknowns. Um, that's a second class of system. There's a third class of system, which I call complex. And that complex system is what I call the unknown unknowns, because there's um, a level of, of such high complexity in that system, you don't know whether it is inherently indeterministic or a, simply a predictable model, but an incredibly complex predictable model. So this is where we have this unknown unknowns. And in that third class of models, there's a split. There's that which falls into the predictive class and there's that that falls into the indeterministic class of what I call the fourth model, which is the chaotic model. And the chaotic model, um, I, I believe to be fundamentally unknowable. No matter what technology you throw at it, there is a third class of indeterministic system which we see in certain complex systems such as the weather, um, such as um, I believe the financial markets. Um, I believe that um, understanding chaos is not simply assuming it's chaotic all the time. That, that's not a, at all. What chaos does is it has protracted periods of what is perceived to be predictable conditions, punctuated by what I call endogenous events arising from within the market structure itself. So this is different to say a news trader who is looking at external events that force, what I call forcings into that system. They're from an external origin coming to force a change in that system. There's this inherent endogenous um, complexity within the system itself, which is sufficient to create chaotic indeterministic systems. So my knowledge of science therefore said, right, that's a very complex world. And that's a world where I can outcompete AI and I, I can outcompete the predictive trader because this is inherently indeterministic. How do I adopt models? Yes. That how, how do you trade something that sounds as complex as you've just described and as unpredictable and noisy yes so the way i backtrack is through simplicity so um these incredibly complex models and you might have seen um, these examples such as the double pendulum the triple pendulum where a single pendulum is a very simple yes. um, pattern a, a double pendulum and a triple pendulum creates a much more chaotic pattern now, when you get this chaotic I pattern, have seen those, so I think you can look them up on YouTube, I suppose, can't you, Rich, where you yes. see people swing a, a pendulum that might have a, like an elbow in the middle of the arm and suddenly the That's behavior it. is dramatically different and unpredictable. The, 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 what it will trace out, as it were, is suddenly uh, way That's more right. complex. It, that that's exactly right so uh, this complexity in the in the trace that it makes makes predictive models incredibly hard to navigate that complex environment mm. but um, uh, uh, someone like me will attack this problem saying hey don't worry about predicting it look at a risk mitigation system a system you can deploy in that complex environment uh, that is very simple in nature but allows for this complex trajectories mm -hmm. and this is where i come to the the age-old wisdom of the trend following mob that cut losses short net profits run mm -hmm. you know in these in these systems which are inherently chaos uh, chaotic 
I also know from science that there is another feature of these systems. They are what I call asymmetrical in, um, in trajectory. Um, what that means is that they are, in a complex physics term, it's called time asymmetric. You can't reverse them. So uh, when you get to complex systems um, in science, you deal with this concept called entropy. And entropy is a, a very, very important thing when examining complex systems because um, it's saying that the system is, is, uh, has an arrow of time to it. There is a, a forward motion of that complex motion. And that forward motion means that an egg, you can watch an egg shatter into a million bits. But if you see that shattered egg in a million bits come back to being an egg, you'll know that something is wrong with that video. You know that it is backwards in time. Mm. And this is because when we look at entropic systems, such as um, all living systems, such as uh, the galaxies, such as uh, what, what's driving this universe, um, you see that it is a, a condition driven by entropy. A lot of people think it's a condition driven by energy, but um, it's a condition driven by en uh, entropy. And what, what entropy does is it says, hey, in all this chaos, there are rules being applied here, not only mm -hmm. at the small level, but at the big level. There is rules of structure which are dynamically interacting with the small and the large. And uh, this is where, in science, you get these complex models such as general relativity to explain the large-scale structure of the cosmos, uh, which is about how the small interacts with the large, how um, uh, matter is told how to move by space-time, and space-time tells matter how to move. There's this dynamic relationship about the two. This is what I see happening in these complex adaptive systems. There, in this mad frenetic complexity, there is what I call fractal structure. And in that fractal structure, it is being driven by um, large structure and its interaction with small structure at all scales. And uh, in this world of the fourth box of chaos, this is what is driving um, that uncertainty uh, that is the area that I want to get exposed to because I know that 90% of the market out there don't want to play in that game. That's, that's a game of chaos. That's a game of uncertainty. What the, they'll think to themselves, how do I deal with that level of complexity with my predictive models? And this is where I say, well, we've got a little trick up our sleeve with our simple models. Um, of bringing that, you know, fascinating uh, philosophical approach about, you know, the reality of just how complex the, the, the markets are and the um, difficulty then of analyzing them. What's your, um, give us a little more detail on your, your strategy. So you said you've taken a trend following approach. What kind of markets do you trade um, over? What kind of time frame? And, um, and speak a little bit too to maybe your approach to diversification and, and risk management. Okay, Simon, so um, I view all markets as having their propensity to exhibit these chaotic properties. And uh, when I look at um, distributions of returns of the markets, I all see that uh, these liquid markets over large data sets has what I call fat-tailed regions. They've also got peaks around their equilibrium, which is where the predictive traders harvest their opportunities. But in those tail regions, which most predictive traders want to keep away from because it's more chaotic out there, um, in those particular zones, I apply a trend following model um, and I apply a diversified suite of trend following models um, and a across a diversified array of markets to extract these opportunities that chaos does present from time to time with these enduring trends, what I call the outliers. And um, when I talk about outliers, if you could imagine these trends uh, that can might last two to three years, that most predictive traders, when they are, are trying to navigate these trends, they're always saying, oh, the trend's got to come back down. It's got to mean revert. It's got to change. But I'm sitting on the other side saying they're more uncertain than you recognize, and I'm going to keep riding this trend. So these opportunities, as you are aware, are fairly few and far between. So 
the way I, I need to address this is through intense diversification across markets and also not participating in the market at all times. So my models have to turn off and they've got to turn on. Where they turn on is where my assumption is that as price gets more and more extreme, we find the predictive modelers tend to assume price is going to revert. Now, when these price models get to that extreme level where we have material trends that have been going for a fair while, that's where the predictive modelers are saying, I'm going to mean revert here because it's got to revert back to the equilibrium. I'm saying no, this is the time I participate. So I jump onto these trends right at the time the predictive modelers are saying it's going to go the other way, uh, which is usually after a fairly large price extension. So that therefore means that my lookbacks of my trend following models have to be medium to long term. I'm looking for significant material price moves. And the way I see these markets um, and their fractal nature going from the small to the large is that um, as you go to the medium to long term, these fractal structures of these enduring trends get more and more prominent and uh, the noise associated with those enduring trends gets less and less. So I find higher signals out in the medium to long term for the specific types of trend I'm trying to target, which are these outliers. How, how so, long on average would those trades hold a position for? So on, on average, they might hold um, eight, to one, eight months to one year um, mm -hmm. and their maximum hold might be three, four years. Um, so I'm definitely dealing in the, the medium to long term space of investing and trading. And how many markets do you end up diversifying these strategies over? And is it more or less the same strategy on, on, on each market or each contract? Yeah, so um, the models I deploy, I, I diversify across my system. So I might have 10 different um, trend following systems. And what I mean is that each of those systems has golden rules applied to it for trend following. They all cut losses short and let profits run, but they do it differently. Each one of them does it differently. And each one has a different entry signal. So this gives me what I call diversification of system. Um, and that's, uh, I then apply those diversified systems as an ensemble of systems into this chaotic environment, uh, which um, I find that ensemble methods of forecasting are much more realistic than single trajectory predictions um, in these chaotic environments. Because uh, with these ensemble methods where you've got um, multiple different approaches being applied to these chaotic environments, you find that there is a greater expectation with the ensemble methods that um, overall you're on the right path in these chaotic regimes. Yeah. And the markets are extremely diverse as well. So because I believe that these, what I call these leptokurtic signatures of any liquid market um, offers these tails. Um, uh, my models, because they use um, small bets, um, a stop and a trailing stop, simple forms of exit which mitigate risk, I can afford to trade what others might think are fairly highly correlated markets. But I'm doing that because the interaction between my systems and those markets means that if I'm trading crude oil or Brent um, oil, which are regarded as highly correlated markets, I can get outliers in one and not in the other, simply because of the interaction that my ensemble of trend following systems has with um, those markets. And in our world of chaos, uh, where you might have heard of the butterfly effect, mm -hmm. um, even though we get markets that over the course of time are highly correlated, very small variations of those markets are sufficient to create outliers in my trade outcomes. And this is because the, the small variances in my very non-linear world can amplify um, with the trade outcomes. And this is a different proposition to a predictive trader. So when things become very predictable, they typically are around a, a condition of equilibrium. When things become very unpredictable, they are typically diverging away from equilibrium. It's, you know, in physics, we see this as uh, phase changes between liquid ice to water to gas. We see these transition events occurring between these different ordered phases. 
and uh, those transition events are my tails. Um, the, this highly disruptive um, state that exists as a system is transitioning out of one ordered state, one predictable state, into another ordered state. And um, the, ne the necessary transition causes disruption to the prior state, and then a new state um, is resurrected once that transition is over. And I see this in the financial markets, and that's why in 2008 we see this massive decline in the equities market of, say, 50%. And at the end of that phase, we can see a reversion to a more predictable state. It's the transition's over. And, and the way I see this is, um, if you could imagine, I talked about the 90%, 10% uh, mix, the predictive 90% and the 10% mm -hmm. unpredictive. What happens when you start getting into these unpredictable regimes and these predictive modelers find that their models no longer work? They're forced to become um, price followers like us because they have to exit their positions. And when they do that, they start amplifying our signal. And so the 10% slowly builds to 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. When we get 50% and then we get further above, that's where the trend ends because we're looking at the asymmetry that exists between the 90% and the 10% and how wealth flows to us when the predictive modelers get it wrong. So um, can I just loop... Asymmetry. Yes, just a real quick loop back to your um, background and and working with uh, an RE and, and, and talking with other managers and, and your experience there. Did that... Um, like what did you learn from the way the the uh, traditional fund managers were trading because that sort of relates to what you're talking about now i suppose um what, what was hammered mix... home to me was was the, the 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 people that i really strongly investigated at that stage of my life were what i call predictive modelers they value investors fundamental investors in other words they do this incredible detailed analysis and from that analysis they determine what they call this intrinsic price level that their analysis concludes is that price level. Mm -hmm. They then look at where current price is in relation to that intrinsic price to determine whether it is undervalued or overvalued. So that intrinsic value is an intrinsic um, predictive point in the future that things will converge to. So I view the, their, their models as convergent and predictable. Um, I've got to sit on the other side of that and say that, yes, that is the case a lot of the time, most of the time, but because I'm concerned with um, markets displaying this uncertain um, ability, uh, which is fundamentally unknowable, um, I will therefore have models that are taking the counter position to those predictive modelers, but be, because I know that predictability can reign for very long periods of time, I cannot afford to not mitigate my risk in these predictable environments. So I'm continually cutting losses, which has given me lots and lots of small whipsaws, but I'm never letting my losses get to be non-linear adverse events. They're all small random perturbations, lots of small ones. But when I get it right, with this mass transfer of the predictive modelers getting it wrong, um, suddenly these, these trends explode and, and I'm, I'm riding them far longer than what a predictive person will ever assume or what, what Gaussian models would ever ex assume. So is that the primary risk management defence in all of its simplicity, just that diversification and the, um, and the, uh, the, the cutting losses and letting winners run overall across all those instruments? Yes, incredibly simple, isn't it? And th th this, is, this, is, this is what gives me such a big buzz in that um, I believe um, that the power is had with the simpler approach in these chaotic environments. Of course, that makes sense because you think if I have advanced, super complex models, they're trying to predict things with too much accuracy. Hmm. There's not enough freedom of, of being wrong. But with simpler models, um, which are far less optimized uh, for particular um, future targets, uh, that gives freedom to move and therefore um, with these chaotic features that I'm trying to uh, draw as much of an edge from those chaotic features as I can, the simpler model the better, and which means that I need to mitigate adverse risk all the time but let my profits run. So what that does to my trade distribution is create what we call a, 
a strong positively skewed signature and where I see the predictive model is facing a problem is the negative skew that's inherently embedded somewhere in their premise. Um, so I'm sort of on the counter side to the negative skew with the positive skew, if that makes sense. So how simple is too simple, Rich? Like the, the reality is that um, uh, making money in the markets is difficult. It requires a lot of time and energy. Um, not everyone can do it. So what is the, um, what's the thing that makes the difference between a simple thing that anyone can either do or buy off the shelf and actually being consistently profitable? Because the simplicity is naively simple. It's actually incredibly complex mm. how you come to that simple solution. And uh, the way I view that is that, you know, we, we have simple equations to describe very complex phenomena. General relativity, that's a that blows my mind. That's actually a simple equation. And, and mm. you know, Einstein came to this conclusion that uh, when they talk about parsimony and when they talk about Occam's razor, what, what the physicist is saying is that um, the, whilst being simple, um, what that means is their explanatory power is much greater than the more complex systems, which are much more uh, uh, specific. Um, so when you're trying to explore new domains and you're taking your, your models you've developed for very familiar domains, like the domains around this earth and Newton, um, um, that the, the scientist Newton, uh, developed these very simple models f to explain gravity and, uh, and masses and movement in this simple domain. Um, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't aware of this larger domain out there which challenged some of his simple assumptions in his models. Mm. Einstein came along and said, that's a very um, good localized solution, Newton, but it's one solution and there are more comprehensive solutions when you have to start looking at things such as black holes and complex curvatures and, and things that Newton wasn't even concerned with in his small domain. And so Einstein revised Newton's propositions to create something that totally blew everyone's mind because it wasn't just a revision, it was a total reforcing of this idea of, of what Newton had about um, time being static, space being static. Newton blew that apart with his dynamical models showing that space and time were relativistic concepts and how and all of these things. It led to this incredible expansion of understanding, but his, his model was very simple hmm. uh, and his, his formula was very simple. That's the way I view these markets. So whilst I say uh, trend following models are very simple, it's naively simple because there's a hell of a lot of work I've had to do in my research to get to where I am now with these simple models mm. under diversification. All right, well, um, let's move forward from there then and, um, and tell me a bit about how you do get to those models in the sense of your strategy creation process. Um, you know, say, generating an idea, testing it, do you have a process for that testing? And then how do you make sure that you're not fooling yourself and curve fitting to the data when you do test those ideas? Great point, Simon. Okay, so the fundamental principle or assumption that I use for my models is the assumption that um, these outliers, these, um, these indeterministic chaotic regions are prevalent in all liquid markets. That's a big assumption. And I've tested that across all the liquid markets I come into um, contact with. And I test that by looking at very long term data sets. And those data sets all conclude that they have this leptokurtic signature. So as soon as I see that they've got fat tails in that, I know they're dealing with what I call nonlinear mechanics. And as soon as I know that they're dealing with nonlinear mechanics, I can go to my scientific fallback that nonlinear mechanics leads to chaotic structure that is fundamentally unknowable, indeterministic. So knowing that gives me so much certainty. And I test that um, also in the backtest environment. So when I'm testing my, 
what I call these 10 trend following systems, these ones I've told you about, mm -hmm. they are universally applicable across all liquid markets. What that means is I'm not looking for characteristic patterns that each individual market might have. I'm looking for a universal principle that is found in all those markets, but it's not a pattern, it's a universal principle um, over very long term data sets. So I'm not targeting patterns, which means I can choose to adopt very simple models that don't curve fit, don't over optimize, because over optimizing or curve fitting is a condition that is found when you rely on uh, the, the signals or, the, or the, the inferences contained in your back test to project in the future. And, and when I look at a particular market, it does have characteristic signatures and mean reverters will deploy those characteristic signatures. Technical analysts will deploy those characteristic patterns. AI will deploy those characteristic patterns into the future. It's this learning exercise. What I'm saying is no, that's a world that I don't wish to compete in. That's a predictive world. I'm looking at these universal properties, these tails, which are unpredictable. So how do I trade an unpredictable price pattern? And, and I've, I've got to take a bet, either a long or a short bet, but I've got to, in that decision, cut the other side off short. So if I take the short bet, something that is fundamentally um, you know, indeterministic, if I take the short bet, I make sure that I have my, my trailing stop and my stop close to the adverse proposition to that directional bet I've taken, vice versa for the long bet. And, and by that very simple model, giving lots of freedom to move, I then just ride the uncertainty, uh, which most of the time gets me losses, whipsaws, but some of the time it gets me 100 ATR or R moves. And, and R is a term we use um, when we, we strike an entry price and we put a stop in place. Uh, the distance between the entry and your stop is one R. So I've had um, instances in my back test where I've got models that uh, some of my trends last 100 R over two to three years. Um, the, these indeterministic things that people, uh, this is where these outliers can deliver monstrous profits. And so when I look at my trade distribution of returns, I see that 90% of those returns are basically dealing with the noise of prediction, dealing with my models being wrong because those models have been that have been applied in environments that are fairly predictable and I've been wrong in my assumption, 90% of them. But because I've constrained my risk for every one of those bets that I've placed in those 90%, I've limited my adverse risk. But because I've let my profits run, in the 10% of chances that um, exist in my trade distribution, they've been king hits. So under this massive diversification, these king hits, these non-linear king hits, because I've got say 100 R compared to a normal loss, which is one R, you can see the, the non-linear relationship 100 times that small loss. That's where Ed Sakota says, one big win pays for them all. Mm -hmm. um, I might have five to 10% of my distribution being the big wins. They pay for um, them all, the 90%, um, which can be wins, small wins and small losses. That's how randomness goes and that's how noise goes. Mm -hmm. But uh, they can be so big, that's what creates my wealth trajectory over the long term. Um, presumably then you, you're trailing a stop yep. along that. So you would still need to, would you not test out a little bit, um, you know, just how far behind you want to trail that stop and how yes. much you're prepared to give back. So is that... A, a sort of a traditional um, uh, just machine learning approach to to finding if, averages if there imagine, or how do you keep that simple it it's not simple um, and the way I test that is through massive data set testing massive data um, so I'm not only testing my models on one market I'm testing them across my entire portfolio that might be 70 markets 100 markets whatever it is so because I'm looking for this universal principle, I'm looking at massive um, sample size, massive sample size with my trade distribution. And if you can imagine, I describe what I call the, the typical leptokurtic um, curve of the markets, where you've got these fat tails, 
uh, and this sort of sits outside what we call a normal distribution. So with my data sampling and where I set my trails and where I set my stops, I'm trying to find the boundary between the Gaussian distribution and the nonlinear distribution. So I'm trying to find a, rate, a, a boundary where things become nonlinear from linear. So in the um, under the Bell distribution, the Bell curve of a Gaussian distribution, that's a linear distribution. Um, you can get that through flicking a coin, an unbiased coin. When you flick the coins and you plot um, your consecutive wins and your consecutive losses, um, that plot will follow a normal distribution, uh, a random distribution. But leptokurtic distributions means that uh, it's not a game of chance. At the peak of a leptokurtic distribution, there is an area which is exploited by the predictive trader around an equilibrium, around an assumption of a future state, around this equilibrium. At the tails, this is another area where an edge can be exploited, which is the area I'm focused on with my particularly focused, concentrated technique at those tails. And I'm looking for the boundary of normality and the boundary of chaos. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so where so, I place my stops and trailing stops with massive sample size says, hey, this is, a, this is the boundary of where linearity meets non-linearity. This is where I'm going to stick them. Boom, boom. Down they go. And they will change over the course of, of the trend because their volatility adjusted as, you, as you, these stops and trailing stops as they go over the course of a trend. I'm using what I call a, a chandelier exit technique, which means that your trail moves behind price, but is allowed to breathe under high volatility and is allowed to contract under low volatility, but it trails price all the way. So that gives me my, my statement that I will let profits run provided it sits above that trailing exit condition and that trailing exit condition will eventually decide when that system decides that that trend is ended. And I've got 10 different systems interpreting trends differently. Right, but of those 10 different systems, they, those systems more or less get deployed as they are over any contract or do you tweak things per, per contract? And just talk to, talk to us a little bit about, because um, obviously I trade stocks, but you're really trading either futures or CFDs and just mention something about trading CFDs in Australia as well. Sure. So um, because I'm on the hunt for maximum diversification with my models, and the reason for that is that I find that my, um, the number of outliers I get in my distribution increases with more diversification. This is different to uh, the predictive modeler who assumes that there is a certain level of diversification which is optimal, and beyond that, um, diversification gets more and more marginal. And the reason they're doing that, that is that they're not... They're, they're, they're looking at things in a what I call a homogenous way, assumptions in a homogenous way. They're, they're assuming that all markets um, display similar behavior uh, in general, efficient market hypothesis, sharp, all of these things are based on these simplified assumptions of how markets behave, but it's not the reality. In my non-linear world, I know that small perturbations can make massive differences. So um, in my hunt for outliers, specifically because I'm targeting outliers as opposed to a predictable condition, I know that I can get maximum diversification. To achieve that, um, because I've got finite capital, and I'm not a Jerry Parker of this world who's, who's got you know, millions and millions um, as finite capital, I've got far less capital. Um, the way I do it um, in-house with my models, this is outside of my job with East Coast Capital Management, which I'll explain shortly, but um, in my, my, my operations as a retail trader, effectively with finite capital, I'm using CFDs because they give me maximum diversification potential um, as opposed to say futures, which means that um, unfortunately futures don't give me the ability to trade micro lots. And uh, because CFDs give me the ability to trade very small bets, that means I can massively diversify both in markets and systems. Just remind me, you pay a holding cost of um, um, <clears throat> a cost of carry, more or less, for trading CFDs, do you not? And does that impact, uh, especially, a long-term trading strategy? 
depends depends on uh, the markets you trade and the interest rates at that time. But you can get positive carry uh, with going short. You can uh, tr um, have negative carry going along. Uh, the interest holding co costs can be beneficial to you, what we call positive swap, mm -hmm. or they can be negative to you, called negative swap. Um, that's important in our CFD world, and you've got to take the inherent differences of the markets we mm -hmm. trade in CFD land versus futures, because some of those impacts of transaction costs are different, and you've got to um, assess that in the models you develop to trade these markets. Um, because there are in inherent differences. Typically in CFD land, because um, it's, it's, it's done by um, um, brokers um, who act as the counterparty to your trades in the CFD world, they're market makers for the CFD world, um, you will find that uh, there are, the brokers have specific conditions that need to be met for the traders, which necessarily mean that you might need to trade these models slightly differently to how you're trading other markets. And typically the impost of trading costs in the CFD world is higher than futures. You're trading higher on average holding costs, higher on average spreads, higher on average commissions. This is all for the convenience of trading CFDs. And so you've got to balance up the additional transaction costs of the product you're trading, like CFDs, against the diversification benefits and the convenience of trading those pro products, which are CFDs. And when I do that evaluation, I say, yes, I recognise I'm paying higher costs, but the benefits of diversification are so extreme. This is the, the product for me to apply while I've got small finite capital. Mm. When I become a big boy, I view what I'm doing in my retail world as a bit like a novice with trainer wheels in an environment. And when I become a big boy with money AUM under, under me, uh, then I'll be able to trade futures, which has lower transaction costs. And uh, in the scheme of things, that's where you want to be in that futures environment for our particular type of models. Now, are you using um, AI? And you have spoken to me a little bit about um, some projects with ChatGPT that, that I thought were very fun. Can you, um, can you enlighten us a little bit on your experiences with ChatGPT? Sure. I'm, I'm embracing ChatGPT as another fantastic tool. Um, so I loved it when spreadsheets first came out. I loved it when algorithms came out. I love it when programming came out and I'm loving it when AI come, comes out. Mm. It, it has this ability to uh, really interrogate big data and come out with some pretty great ideas yeah. using that approach. So the approach, for instance, I used was that um, in deciding a, a possible universe to trade, and this is an example where I said to myself, right, let's assume I wanted to apply my models to stocks. Now, one of the, the key assumptions of my models is that I'm trying to find uncorrelated markets to trade. Um, that gives me, at the diversified level, a little extra edge because these uncorrelated markets produce risk offsets, which reduce the volatility that I naturally get chasing my outliers. So I do like uncorrelated markets, and I say to ChatGPT, hey ChatGPT, can you please scan the S&P 500 um, and select 20 markets or 30 markets that are uncorrelated using logic alone, not using correlation properties, using logic alone. And ChatGPT comes back saying, sure can and it does its analysis, comes back with these 20 to 30 stocks. And it's, I said, please list these and the reasons for your, your choosing under the, your logical framework. And it comes out with a stock in healthcare, a stock in um, AI, a stock in here, a stock in there. And it says, and it gives the reasons, the, the, the functional reasons in logic space, why they are uncorrelated. And we say, well, that's great. But the thing about AI like ChatGPT, so you've always got to validate what comes out from it because it might sound great, but you've got to validate it. So then mm. I said, I got ChatGPT to validate itself. I said, right, you've selected these ones. Now, use data that you've got available to yourself. I said, no, I've only got data up to 2021. I said, well, use that data mm -hmm. and um, use it to evaluate on a correlation basis 
your stocks you selected during using logic to see if they have these uncorrelated properties. And it says, so can, comes back and it says, correct, uh, my logic is sound. It demonstrates that uh, not only through logic, but also through the correlation properties of the data that I've assessed over 20 years, 30 years or whatever, they are uncorrelated. And I go, great, I said, fantastic. And then you chuck that into your backtest environment. Mm -hmm. And then you find you've got something that delivers returns well in excess of the index with much lower volatility. There you go. 20, 30 years, there you go. So uh, it's just an idea. It's just mm. an example of how you use AI to, to um, expand your capabilities. You want to leverage off your computers, leverage off these tools, because we've got a very creative brain that does things incredibly well, but it doesn't do some things very well. Lots of crunching, lots of processing, big data. Brain's not too good because the brain likes to heuristically try and resolve things and all of these biases come in. So th this is where ChatGPT is great. So in, in building these sim simple, if you like, models, coming back then to that, um, the, they're obviously there because they're enduring. You expect them to last a long time. Is there, is there a, um, a framework in your world for assessing whether a particular model is just no longer valid or, or needs to be retired? Is there... Uh, that kind of process or really things are uh, there to be um, used because they are long-term and enduring they're expected to continue to work no matter what yeah so it's a bit different in our world to say the predictive world <clears throat> with predictive models um, what they do is they typically use in sample data and then they see how it performs in outer sample data and if it falls off the cliff as soon as they go into the outer data sample they say that's a bad model strike it off the list we won't go with that anymore. We don't do that because um, all of our models have been rigorously tested with using historical data. And the two things that they say is, how have they, how have they performed when outliers have been present in that historical data? If we find there is a positive correlation to those outliers, that's a tick. How have they performed to other risk events? Um, so uh, things that long predictive stretches, all of these things, that's where we're looking at things like adverse drawdowns, the adverse side of um, the risk. Um, it comes back and say, yes, it is optimally operated within those adverse risk environments. That's a big tick to our models because uh, we're gonna be putting these models into a future environment that we hope is uncertain. So if there are future outliers, there's a good chance our models will catch them. And um, if there aren't, there's a good chance that our models won't fall off the cliff. But we've got no preconceived idea or expectation about how they're gonna perform because we are dependent on these outliers that are by definition un unpredictable in nature. So. The way I um, do this is um, I don't, for instance, have a threshold to say, if I achieve a drawdown of 40% on a particular model, I'm going to eliminate it from my basket of models because I know it's past the test. This is just an unfortunate instance um, of a predictable, predictable regime that's lasted longer because I'm confident that they will capture those outliers if it occurs in that market. But because I'm diversified, the impact of that adverse risk over the long term, small losses building up is small for the portfolio because it's so diversified. So the way I do this is every year I add new data to my in incredibly long data set testing across multi markets and many years of history. So each year I'm generating new algorithms to trade the following year. Each year as more data comes in, that's giving me more possible um, historical outliers to test, uh, more possible historical conditions that haven't been seen previously in the back test to test against. So it's a type of robustness testing where I'm using uh, an extended data set to regenerate models. So uh, at the end of each year, I use a whole new fresh batch of models, um, whether or not those models have performed well or not in the mm. prior year. Uh, but what I do do is I allow those models to run to their completion, but I supplement them with new models each year. It's a bit like evolution in action, if you could imagine mm. what I'm trying to achieve there. That's an interesting approach. I like that. Yeah. All right. So um, 
I guess just just going fine, just starting to wrap up, but just to go a little bit deeper into the strategies while we're here. Um, uh, your um, your building strategies that uh, that 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 are enduring, and then you'll review them with the new data that that comes in. Um, that whole so I guess going back to the the so and at the end of the year when you're um, updating those models, is there a new idea generation process? Like if you're if you're reading and learning through the year as well, like how much can things change, and and how do you continue to generate? I guess those ideas for those updates. So as as, as my learning improves, my um, I'm always sort of looking at new models. Uh, so I, I told you about the 10 trend following models I'm using. You know, I will um, look into new um, models if I find that I think that there might be opportunities that are left unturned uh, with my existing ensemble. But I must admit, um, where I'm at now has been something that's taken a decade to achieve. And I'm incredibly confident with my process. Um, now, what I'm finding with the research I'm doing more and more as new research comes out is it, it's, it's giving a tick box to my process, uh, not requiring me to change it. Um, mm. You know, I, I will always embrace ideas if I find that they are better ideas, better models. I'll always embrace that. But it's getting to a point now where through Occam's Racer, through parsimony, I'm getting down to sufficiently complex models in other words not too light not too complex mm. you know what I mean that, that that balance I'm pretty happy with that and you don't need to tweak it much so you've got a very strict process for that um, that annual update is that in itself quite codified and strict is that almost an automated process or what does that look like yeah so uh, the entire process of portfolio construction from the ground up um, we've tried to make systematic. Um, so all rules-based algorithms that create the process. So um, most people are familiar with algorithms that they can get an algorithm and then apply it to trade something. We use algorithms in the construction process to get to those end stage algorithms, if you know what I mean. So there's a workflow process we use where the first thing is uh, we say, right, uh, Fred, uh, the coder that I use, will, will I'll say to him, Fred, go out and um, develop uh, 10 uncorrelated trend-following models. And he'll go out. And I'll say, we'll say, let's keep it simple. Maybe have five or six parameters at most. Uh, let's make sure that the golden rules of trend-following are embedded in it. And um, you come back with your design solutions. Fred comes back with 10, say, design solutions. Then what we do is we say, right, now let's put it into the systematic environment, testing environment, where we'll say these trend following models, because of our particular assumptions, must be capable of trading any liquid market we present it with. So then what we do is we say, let's get a data set of, say, 200 markets to evaluate our models with. Uh, we will then say, in with those models, uh, which are trend following models, we want you to determine across all 100 markets, every single one of them, uh, what are the parameters we should use for, or the variables to use for those parameters uh, for all of those 10 models. So if you can imagine that is a massive multi-market test mm. where it is testing not only on an individual market, but the entire 100 market data. Uh, and it's coming up to uh, these, these variables that is finding what we're calling the edge of chaos and, and uh, the edge of normality, hmm. where, where that edge lies. That process comes up with those variables. So then we say, right, uh, they're the trend following models. Now let's what we call visually map those models to market. And this is where we test for over-optimized models. So fortunately in our trend following world, outliers are visually very easy to see. They stand out like proverbials when you are looking at market data and you see where an outlier is, it's obvious. So we then, what we call map to market our models. Does the model perform well in the outlier region? And how does it perform outside of that outlier region? If it performs well in an outlier region, that's a tick. 
If it performs well outside of the um, outlier region, we give it a cross because uh, if we have trend following models that work when markets are, are constrained and not offering trends, there's got to be something wrong with the model. Hmm. So what we're looking is the correlation. So, sorry, between... just, to re just to repeat yep. that so I understand. Um, the, the model should deliver in the way that it's expected in the market the kind of ex market that it ex it's expected to perform well in and if it's not a favorable market it shouldn't perform well otherwise it's suspicious That's right. and if you find something um, that doesn't tell you that suspect overfitting mm. this is where your models might be fit to random noise as opposed to the signals you're trying to extract from that market yeah so also so we've got very simple designs we test across multi-markets we've got this map to market process which is all all three of those are aimed at reducing the ability of our models to be overfit to a specific um, characteristic of a market or noise to a market all of these are our way of robustness testing our models and then at the end of this process therefore we might have 2,000 solutions <coughs> that uh, we've only got finite capital to deal with how do we collectively compile those solutions into an optimal portfolio trader and the way we do that is through a process of um, not not through correlation studies, looking at the individual correlation statistics of each return stream. We're looking at the entire return stream of each of those um, systems, and we are iteratively bundling them up into groups of say 40. So let's say we've got finite capital to trade 40 markets. Which of those return streams out of the 2000 are we gonna trade? We use an iterative process uh, where we are bundling together for 40 possibilities out of that 2000 selection to produce the optimal part dependent risk metric ma ratio mm. um, so that you can imagine this is a very crunching computer intensive process it's, that's working over billions and billions of iterations to come up with that and once we come up with that we know there's numerous tick boxes in that entire process that is tested for robustness tested for over optimization tested for curve fitting we're very happy to take that bundle of 40 strategies as our next year's addition uh, for our trend following portfolio and then next year more data comes in we do the same process again etc so have i understood correctly that uh, one thing that could change year to year is the actual markets traded yes yes absolutely and um if you're comfortable now ideally jerry jerry would be trading all markets but remember in our finite capital yeah. world of a retail trader we can't do that we must make a selection unfortunately and so this is how we select um if you're comfortable just discussing maybe or giving us some insights into the software and the data that you would use to to go through this kind of process so um look there's off the shelf software such as um, um strategy quantix um, adapt trade uh, there's a few of these uh, uh, what we call data mining software but you've got to be careful with data mining software and how you use it because it can develop very over optimized solutions mm. so but um, it, within strategy quantex there are particular processes a trend follower can use using um, what we call a custom project functionality of SQX um, to um, rigorously assess and then compile your portfolio through an iterative workflow process like I've described. Mm. But Fred and I have decided to do it ourselves outside of that environment. So uh, we use uh, just a, a simple platform that um, is tradable such as MetaTrader, Met MT4. And then Fred uh, develops coding outside of the MT4 environment that then uses the engine of MT4 to undertake the tests. Mm. Uh, but uh, what we can do is we can set the whole process, workflow process up where we click a button and then three days later come back to a compiled portfolio. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. And that gives you a lot more control Yeah, that way. All right, well, we should start wrapping up. We've just broken the hour mark. Um, tell me a little bit about um, in, in, tell me a little bit about educating the average investor about quantitative trading and um, and whether they should be more interested in allocating to this perhaps they don't even know about it and and as part of that just tell us a little bit about ECCM 
Yeah, so systematic trading, you and I both stand in the same court here. We, we advocate for systematic trading. Um, in my world of trend following, where you're dealing with thousands and thousands of return streams, you, you cannot do that in a discretionary manner. Uh, you must have a systematic rules-based process to apply that because um, we cannot operate at the speed computers can do to run our models with fidelity, run our models according to our back test. Um, systematic is also essential because um, it's a way in science, it's, it, it's akin to having a hypothesis or a model and then empirically testing that hypothesis using data using what's available, historical data, as a way to empirically validate that model. I talked about Newton before, and then Einstein. So Newton had his data generated from the earthly planet, and his models were developed, and they were very successful models used for hundreds of years based on the data that was available to this planet. Unfortunately, the models were not precise enough to account for things such as we take for granted in GPS satellites now uh, to give us the specificity of, of location target. Things that can't account for gravitational anomalies such as black holes, uh, massive scale structures, uh, things that can't account for the smallest microscopic structures you find in quantum physics. Um, so uh, in that broader domain, uh, Einstein started using more data from uh, you know, Venus, from yes. black holes, from solar system. So it, it's, science is continuously empirically validating its models against the data. Uh, that's what we do in our world, recognizing that we, our domain might be small to start with, but as you increase your domain, more and more data is required to validate your hypothesis. That's a systematic side. Now, what was the other question you asked? Um, you? Tell us about ECCM. I know you do. So, okay, so um, I am what you call a, a strategy ambassador for East Coast Capital Management. They are a, a Sydney-based fund manager that specialises in, in my core strength, diversified systematic trend following. Mm. So um, I work closely with the managing director, Adam Haverliv, and um, it's a, a, we've, we've currently just generated an information memorandum for the fund. Um, it's had a... a, a a track record since um, uh, January the 1st, uh, 2020, up to current day, but now it's being un umbrellaed um, with an information memorandum to expand on, um, and we're looking to attract investors to to that currently. So very excited about yeah. that. Um, all the rules I've been talking about that I do personally, in some way, shape or form, has been um, umbrellaed into Adam's work. Uh, we're very much aligned, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's that's exciting. great, and 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 they've done really well. So that is exciting. Um, all right, Rich. Well, um, look, just to finish off, going from the um, the institutional side to the retail side, if you were just to give some advice to someone right at the other end, perhaps just starting off or early in their trading slash systematic trading journey, any advice for them? I would say my advice to anyone is continually question, uh, never adopt, never adopt something learnt from elsewhere and assume it's valid. Um, you must test it yourselves to not only develop the confidence, but also make sure that it, it marries with your brain, uh, the way you think the world works. Um, you, there's a learning that goes on with trading where you're continually building your, your brain, you're building your strategies, they, they work in tandem together. So uh, it's got to be a personal achievement um, of self-reliance, not dependence. Um, where you get dependency, there's going to be failure. Uh, so read the books, read the hard books, not the easy books, read the hard books, read the challenging books. Um, Look at, uh, look at uh, what's currently being produced by economics as questions, not as facts. Mm. Uh, things you want to test for yourself, validate for yourself. They're, they're the things I'd be, be basically saying as advice. And get a mentor, get mentors that are, you want to stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. So get those giants, understand what they've gone through because it's not an easy game it's incredibly hard mm. and you need those mentors to give you guidance wonderful all right well is there anything else i've missed rich that you want to touch on 
Absolutely nothing, Simon. All Complete. Right. That's brilliant. And I really appreciate that. That was a great um, journey through the scientific process and approach to trading. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, how would pe I suppose if people want to get in contact with you or myself, it's really the, the same thing. They can just simply start at our website for the podcast, thealgorithmicadvantage.com. Um, all right, Rich, let's leave it at that. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Many thanks, Simon. And see you all. Bye-bye. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.